Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cover.TV for your Tuesday morning dose of positivity, inspiration, learning, whatever it else is you need. We are here for you here at Cuppa, and we have got a fantastic show lined up with a good friend of mine, Mark Butler, coming back into Cuppa to talk, give you a bit of up yours against burnout and, and all that rest of the thing. He's got some fantastic tips, so I can't wait to welcome you in very, very soon. Uh, but before I kick it off, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connections to lands, water and community. I, I pay my respects to them and to their cultures and to the elders, both past, present and emerging. Also want to thank all the Indigenous leaders and elders who have appeared on Kappa and thank them for the learning journey that they've taken us all on over the last few years. Well, setting the scene, self-care and burnout, the topic area doesn't seem to go away. In fact, I think it's getting worse. Um, and today's guest, Mark Butler, has just written a book called Up Yours. Yep, that's right, Up Yours. Uh, and I'm going to be welcoming Mark very soon. But Mark is a mental health expert and strategist with over 12 years clinical and psychotherapy experience, underpinning 25 years commercial experience. He helps individuals, teams and businesses thrive in this space. And right now I'm going to welcome in Mark. Mark, welcome to Cuppa, mate. Good to have you back Thank in. Thank you very much, Luke. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Uh, good to see some people in the chat room this morning. Hello, Tanya. Ben, we've got multiple chat rooms live today. We're also streaming live directly to International Towers. So hello to everyone out there as well. Now, Mark, um, yes, sir. you've been on before. You've been on before with Kappa. So today I want to I want to I want to find out a little bit more about you though, buddy. Okay. Are we gonna Ooh. kick off with some espresso questions? Just some quick right. questions to get us off the mark this morning. First one is, mate, what what did what did teachers say about you, buddy? Ooh, uh, in school, probably must try harder would have been the likely one. I wasn't very good at sport, um, so I, I kind of had to find my, my way in other ways, if you like. And, and I think um, uh, I, I, seem to, I seem to remember ending up in a kind of a role where I was sort of like a kind of a student's council idea, kind of the, the bridge between students and teachers in times of conflict and stuff like that. Something oh, that just kind of gravitated to, which maybe in, uh, is how I've ended up where I am today, because that's large, a lot of what I do as well. Yeah. What do you love most about what you do and why, Mark? I think uh, I think it's just seeing transformation in people. Uh, so you know, you alluded um, uh, very likely to my background. So yes, while I was working in the corporate space, like twenty five or more years in corporate, it's about fifteen years now uh, where I was involved in sort of clinical work. And yep. don't add those two numbers together and think he's doing all right for seventy five. They kind of ran side by side, and it was part of my journey out of burnout, and that's where it all began. But but it was working with with you know people in in very challenged environments you know veterans with post traumatic stress and people in recovery from addiction, first responders, police, fireys, etc. So and, and I think it's just seeing the transformation for people when they get the sort of support that they need to just drive forward and transform and be themselves. I think that's yeah. probably the most valuable thing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And my successful achievement to date in your career, would you say? Ooh, uh, look, uh, I, I'm an Irish Catholic, so so bragging doesn't come easily to me because I'll be I'll turn into a pillar of salt if I do. But look, I think I, I got to work with some amazing people in developing what was what was very close to being a world first treatment model for veterans with post traumatic stress and substance amazing. use. So, in other words, the ones who were now homeless. Um, politics got in the way and kind of dragged it back so so a comp uh, an organization i was working with in the u.s kind of bunny hopped us a little bit but we do have an australian first uh, treatment program for people in that environment which translates very nicely to to other first responders as well and so i think i mean there was probably about five or six years of kind of pro bono work in that it was a yep. labor of love I, that's awesome. probably yeah, I think that's probably it, yeah. Well, you've got so much value to give, mate, and I want to get into your book and also open that book for uh, tips and advice for people that are watching today. Now, if anyone's got any questions, feel free to put them into the chat room whenever you want to, okay? Um, so what do you hope people walk away with from today's conversation, Mark? Probably a, a deeper understanding. You know, I talk about radical self-care. That's what this book is about. Uh, and the book is the culmination of a lot of the work I did during COVID lockdowns, etc. So 
we talk about self-care that gets bandied around a lot, but it's more than sleep, diet and exercise. I think, you know, from a radical wide ranging from the ground up sort of approach, we have to look at uh, self-compassion, self-awareness as well as self-care. And, and I think that's what when I say up yours, it's upping your self-care in every domain. Um, and don't just look at sort of increasing your exercise or cutting down on, you know, food or whatever it is. All but right, buddy. Not that it's it's way more than that. All right. Let's get into it. So mm -hmm. this is the book, The Pursuit of Radical Self-Care. And by the way, Samantha said Irish Catholics are filled with guilt. It's not our strength. Oh, A-level. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the book is up there, mate, The Pursuit of Radical Self-Care. You're just giving us a bit of a guide from it. But the book flows into real three, three very simple, when I say simple, probably not as easy to execute, but three simple frameworks. Can you share what those frameworks are? I'm going to put an image up on screen right now and you can talk sure. through them. But... Yeah, look, so so basically, as I say, sleep, diet, and extra exercise, although it uh, they are really important. Basically, if the engine's not running, we're, you know, we're not going to be going anywhere. So so things like sleep, diet, exercise, and mindset, etc., are really, really important. But they're not the be all and end all. And very often people lock on to one or two things that they want to change. And that might be a good start, but we need to look from a much broader perspective as to how we're looking after ourselves. So I kind of broke it down into three main areas. So I say look up is kind of stop, smell the roses, see how you're actually treating and dealing with yourself. And, and you can make some adjustments there. And it's not about giving up something. It can be adding something in, um, you know, into our, our sort of well-being, if you like. When I talk about looking in, I'm talking about taking a real deep introspective sort of journey. Uh, and, and I'm talking... Uh, I, I can't remember who, who originally said this, but, but basically the premise is that everything we need to thrive, we have within us. It's yeah. already, self, we're, you know, we're a complete self-contained uh, sort of unit. And that's true until it's not. Sometimes we need a little bit of guidance, you know, um, and support from externally. But, but when we're looking in and just doing a sort of a, a stock take of ourselves, if you like, or an audit of ourselves, there's a whole host of things we can look at. Um, Dan Siegel, uh, Dr. Dan Siegel talks about the healthy mind platter and, and I took that idea and expanded on it uh, a bit more on some other areas that we can sort of look at and so in that sort of part of the book or in any of the programs and training I do we look at brain health because for yeah. so long we've looked at the brain as being like a computer that shuts down at night time and, and has a rest and, and that always kind of seemed odd that you know, it's very inefficient if you have to shut a machine down for eight hours out of every 24. Mm, so there's, there had to be something else going on. And there is. There's an all, a huge host of stuff that's happening in our brains all the time. So we have a look at that and we have a look at how we can, the things we can do to sort of support brain health. Because it's an organ just like every other organ in the body. Yep. And, and we need to treat a little better. When I say looking out, it's then how do we in this sort of self-contained unit sort of connect and interrelate and, and, and sort of become involved in our, our sort of environment. So in other words, we look at relationships and things like belonging and connection, which are survival traits, survival instincts that we absolutely have to have. Boundaries play a huge part in that. And I, and, and I, I find myself speaking about boundaries a lot. And we can tap into that a bit more if you want in a minute. Yeah, but I do. Basically, boundaries are essentially where I end and the rest of the world begins. And does that feel safe where I'm at? And, and then probably um, the other aspect of uh, looking out is, is, is uh, the concept of play. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've had a conversation about this before, what that actually means. So we can tap into that, too, because spoiler alert, it's the first thing to go when we're feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. No, that's not of course good. it is. So I want to just, can you share with us what was happening to you when you weren't looking up and experiencing burnout, Mark? Oh, yeah. No, it's a while ago. But um, I was uh, I was working in a, a, I was actually working for two organizations at the time um, to, uh, in, in the film industry. And um, so, you know, there was one was Hollywood, one was Australia. Um, fabulous companies, both. But yeah. I was trying to kind of, straddle two horses if you like <laughs> trying to you know trying to ride two horses and 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 it was a challenge it was difficult uh you can have divergence sort of marketing plans etc so 
So it was um, it was during that role um, uh, in, in an industry uh, that was that was really growing and big at the time. Um, I experienced some uh, quite a good deal of burnout actually, but and and I know I was mindful of my people to make sure they were okay, but it was at the cost mm-hmm. of myself. Two things were going on. First was if they can if they seem to be okay, then why aren't I? So therefore, the self critic comes in, and I should be able to do this, and I'm failing i'm letting everyone down that's the sort of message we give ourselves and and so we kind of push it to one side so we can we can see burnout in other people before we'll see it in ourselves or maybe it's before we admit to seeing it in ourselves and so that's what was happening for me uh and actually as my team pointed it out to me uh and they said you're not doing so good and mm-hmm. i said yeah these chest pains are seem to be getting worse <laughs> you know that sort of a thing and 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 it was then that i kind of knew that i had to take some steps take some drastic steps mm. I, I i found because i i reached burnout in my media career i was always you know burning the candle at both ends yeah uh, i was in the sales remit so you know the cycle never stopped you're only as good as your next yeah, month i was i was trying to drive a team to succeed i was the sales director of a media organization i never really wanted to be a bloody sales director of a media organization i didn't know where my next step was yeah uh, you know the the rattle gun just kept on continuing like i'm sounding right now just uh, and i couldn't get off the train i felt like i couldn't i couldn't stop because you know i needed money to pay for a mortgage you know and then all those critical aspects started to feed in and i burned yeah. myself out and yeah. I, i've said it before on cuppa like my wife and i sat down uh, she was the one that brought it to my attention really quickly in saying that you're not yourself. And we wrote down a red flag list, just all the things that weren't me. I was drinking too much. Um, uh, I was agitated, not uh, very short with my answers, not giving enough people enough time. And yeah, um, I wasn't enjoying life, like all these red flags. And you know, I've still got that list today, Mark. I've still got yeah. that list today. Look, absolutely, Cookie. And and actually, I'll tell you, this this taps into uh, some conferences I've been working at recently and, and talking to people about burnout and, and, you know, dispelling this idea that it's always just too much work. Not necessarily. In fact, what, what, what I think the most of it is, and, and Gallup research just came out recently that confirms this or affirms this, it's actually, it seems to be lack of clarity. That's what I, I, be, I agree. I the, agree. seems to be the biggest thing. Now, it's not too much work. It's, I don't know what's expected of me anymore. My leader is burned out, and two out of three in Australia are. We're, we're yeah. with the highest rate of burnout in the world. Um, and, and so when people are trying to get clarification and distinction, et cetera, and, and feedback from their leader, who is already burned out, just like you and I were, and you said it became short, I was exactly the same, snapping at people, around me where it kind of felt safe to snap you know unfortunately yeah. partners and friends more so than you know yeah. other people in the workplace um and so if your leader is kind of snapping and short tempered with you you're you're just you're not going to go and ask for clarification on something because it ain't worth the fight so now i'm sitting here drifting the leader isn't getting what they need the person you know the team doesn't know what the leader wants and and that ain't going to end well but yeah. i think that's it could be, uh, and it was actually a, a really good um, HR uh, person, uh, Jordan Al Hassan. Hassan was her name uh, at one of the conferences. Pointed out, and she said, "A lot of people think bullying is the biggest problem in the workplace. It's kind of not." But she said, "This is what the bullying looks like: the leader snapping at people mm-hmm. when they should be giving them sort of honest feedback and sort of service leadership." So, yeah. Yeah, mate, it's a, it's an interesting thing. I want to get into some solutions. I want to go through some of these chapters in a bit more detail. Yeah. I absolutely love your second chapter, mate. Burnout makes me wish I had more middle fingers. That's yeah. incredible. But you yeah. referred to it as the canary in the cage. Yeah. Can you share a little bit more about that analogy for people? Sure, sure. Look, a lot of people will know about it. Um, um, people of my age certainly do, but but younger generations may not. The idea was when, when working down a coal mine, uh, coal miners used to sort of collapse quite a lot. There was a poisonous gas that would be down the coal mine or other dangers. And and it took sort of several hundred years for somebody to have the great idea of, of bringing a canary in a cage down the coal mine. The idea being that a male canary will sing incessantly looking in search of a mate no matter where they are. So, so a canary in a, in a cage down the coal mine 
they also, because of their sort of fast metabolism, they actually take in oxygen when they're breathing in and breathing out. So yeah. they're a brilliant little sort of valve, if you like, if some if something's happening down the coal mine. And so, uh, the, so the miners would, if they if they can't hear the canary singing anymore, everybody out. There's clearly a danger. And so when I'm talking with workplaces today, I will say you don't have carbon monoxide in your workplace. And Jesus, no. I hope not, right? Um, but but there's something going on that you can't smell, taste, see, feel, or hear. It doesn't trigger any of the senses. Uh, but something's going on. What do you think it is? And it might sound like a loaded question because, you know, you're thinking the answer is going to be too much work or stress or lack of clarity. But other stuff can come up as well. So using that analogy, it's just a nice metaphor to say, all right, well, What's the gas down your workplace that would cause the canary to collapse? That's the first question. Second question is then, what's your canary? So what is it that gives you the signal that all is not well? And oh. and so we can't keep looking for stronger canaries or fitter coal miners. You know, if there's a gas that if there's something that's causing us to collapse, we need to look at it. And, and what might work that, what, what might that look like, Mark? What mm -hmm. might that look like? So like, is it is it the work pressure? Is it the leadership, well, like what it, the gas it, looks it, like. It, well, the gas could very well. It's generally the answer comes back something in the sort of stress field. So it could be too much work. It could be I can't get any straight answers from my leadership. It could be we're going through another transformation or another change, or we've got a new CEO or we've short staffed or whatever it is. Something's causing us to not be able to thrive and drive forward at our best. Getcha. So it's a bit like the team running onto the pitch, and you've only only seven players run out. It's going to be a hard game, isn't it? You know, no, totally. Uh, or, or you run out with a full team and two of them are limping. Um, you know, we're going to have to play a defensive game now, aren't we? You know, so oh, totally. so it's about sort of shining a light on what we think is the sort of challenge. What's down our coal mine? So, and and then essentially, it's it's kind of comes back to uh, well, what's the canary? How can we know when we're challenged? Uh, and you know, we don't want to wait for the end result of the game to find that we lost two nil. You know, we need to find out. Um, what's going to give us a heads up that all is not well? So what's what's the canary that's going to collapse? And generally, you and I found it. Uh, it was uh, the 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 leader uh, just wasn't themselves and couldn't sort of captain the team as well as they could. So uh, mate, I've, got, I've, got a, I've got a pointy question for you. Point. You know, yep. I suppose it's like um, how long's a piece of string? Um, <laughs> but you know, when you get to that point, like how do we recover from burnout? Gordon Parker is Emirate Professor at New South, uh, University of New South Wales and wrote a book recently with uh, so with Gordon Parker, Gabrielle Taverns, and I'm sorry, one other person, I can't remember their name, but they have a beautiful metaphor in there. They talk about a candle. So a flickering candle, how do you deal with a flickering candle versus a candle that's actually blown out? And there are two totally different responses to it, of course. Shielded right. from the breeze yeah. will be the flickering one. You have to relight it is the other one. Um, and so with burnout, people often think, I'm just going to have to leave. Not necessarily. Um, you know, I work with, with uh, teachers in schools, and you can't really change their role or you can't really introduce a four-day week for them necessarily. But so very often, a, you know, a useful strategy is to, to allow space for a passion project to be brought in. Tell okay. me something that you would like to see changed in the, in the role or in the workplace. And you've got a half a day or a day or a week to sort of you just focus on that and let's see what you come back with. It'll help everybody. And that something like that, it sounds like more work, but it actually allows someone to tap into, give them a sense of purpose that's going to support everybody in the workplace, as an example. Um, you know, so it's usually tap into something like that, get some clarity around what's expected of me. Stephen Covey's First Things First out of that book, you know, The Habits of Highly Successful People. Fantastic way of working. Manage your energy, not your time. There's a bunch of different ways we can do this. And, mm -hmm. and look, it's not always about building stronger canaries. So the answer might be within us, you know, uh, and, and that's what kind of my book says. We could be the best version of ourselves to, to set us up to be resilient to what we experience. But sometimes the car needs a tune-up. But, but this idea, a lot of organizations there during COVID gave everybody a week off. Absolute waste of time. Total waste of time. Because the people who weren't burned out just had a week off, but then came back and found that their budgets and targets and quarterly results hadn't shifted. So now we had to pedal all that much faster. The people who were burned out got a week off and they just spent the whole time trying to catch up and probably didn't. You know, so so taking time off or taking a long weekend 
as a recovery strategy is not good as a maintenance one great idea you know okay. um, we've just got to switch off and rest or play yeah you mentioned earlier in part of the um uh, in part two um yep. you you mentioned about the tra- um, being able to track like getting on track with a healthy brain um yeah can you share more on this for us too because I, I i wanted to expand on that component yeah so so and i alluded to it sort of when we started chatting you know the brain is an organ just like every other organ and there's stuff we will do that will hurt it and stuff we will do that will help it and and there are practices we should do every single day if we can uh to support our brain health and and sleep is becoming i think the number one sort of personal health strategy that we can sort of take and the more we learn about it the more we realize how important it is and and how valuable and necessary it is because there's stuff going on in our brains when we're asleep we used to think it just kind of shuts down but it doesn't Uh, and i talk about our emotional well-being a lot in the book and and you know people think oh i'm not experiencing emotions when i'm asleep What's a nightmare, <laughs> right? Um, so, so we absolutely, we absolutely do. The brain is constantly working, and there's something else that happens when we're asleep. There's uh, a very close cousin of the lymphatic system is the glymphatic system, and that takes physically takes cerebrospinal fluid and physically flushes toxins from the brain, sort of mm. plaques that build up as a result of excess sh- sugar in our in our diets. Mm. Uh, to the extent now where dementia is starting to be called type 3 diabetes. And so, wow. so, so what's happening is that we're not clearing the blood sugars uh, you know, through the normal course of the day. They're building up as plaque in our brains. And when we find that we're not flushing those out, that's when dementia and things like Alzheimer's can kick in because of that excessive plaque in the brain. So mm. that's something that's going on. And, and that lymphatic system needs our eight hours of sleep. It won't do it on five. People that tell you they survive on sleep, five hours sleep, um, way, way, way less than 1% of people can effectively do it, you know? Get so you. so things like sleep, things like um, taking time out, which we all understand what that is, but time in can be focusing on some kind of a passion project, even if it's for 20 minutes a day. Just you, You've locked that time just for yourself to focus on something that you're really passionate about. The time out is like allowing your sort of mind to daydream and wander. That's really mm. important. All of these things take di- sort of different processes in the brain to strengthen the brain and increase gray matter, etc. Uh, you know, we know about exercise and endorphins and all that, but there's there's um, what are they called? Myokines or myokines, which we now understand. Yep. When your muscle contracts, it sends a protein to the brain that develops further, enhances, uh, like as a, an, an antidepressant, if you like. This is, you know, you might have heard recently that exercise is seen to be at least as valuable as an antidepressant medication. And now mm. it's actually looking like one and a half times more, more valuable. And it's so not. So, Mark, just- you, you also mentioned that we, we, the first thing that goes is play. Yeah. So, I like, yeah, it's, it's so true. Like, how much just spontaneous laughter and you know i've got a couple of kids now and you know it's taken me a while to actually enjoy the play Mm. um yeah and and i don't like that's with the kids and stuff like that but like you know even just going out and you know kicking the soccer ball and you know whatever it may be but why is that the the first thing that goes why is that the first thing that goes mark uh, I, I just think because, it, well, there's probably that old adage, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. And then, we, you know, but we've, we kind of, or, or there's the sort of business for first fun later. You know, we've we've grown up with these sorts of things in our heads. Uh, we have to get the work done. Uh, and so when we're finding that we're sort of slipping backwards and not achieving as much as we want or feel like we should, or we're judging ourselves because we're not keeping up with the rest of the team or whatever. We just we work harder. It's what we do. We just lock in. And say, I just got to get this done. If I get this done, I can relax. And of course, it never stops. No. Um, but if we realize and actually taking some time out and just chasing the dog around the back garden, or you know, lying on the ground and coloring in with the kids, you know, um, just do our spontaneous laughter. People live alone. They don't have kids. They don't have sort of family. Um, you know, I was working with somebody recently, and and we talked. About, what can you do for play then? And and I think this might have even been during lockdown. So started locking onto watching comedians on YouTube before going to sleep at night, having a good belly laugh, really, really important. 
it's just stuff that we got to do that sort of shifts us into that sort of actions without consequences, right? So just making an arse of ourselves and having a bit of a play and having a bit of fun. And people often mistake it. I would say to them, what do you do for play? Oh, I play video games. Mm, it's a precursor to addiction. What do you do for, what, <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I, I, you know, I play tennis. Yeah, exercise. You know, if you want to make it fun, play with your non-dominant hand and just have a hit and a giggle, right? That Now, now we're playing. Do you know what I well, mean? That, so, what's that one where it goes around in the circles? The, what was um, that? What's that tennis game where it goes around in the circle? Someone oh, the, 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 the totem tennis or swing ball yeah, or that's something. It. Yeah. yeah, that's tennis. That's tennis. Yeah, yeah. Have a game of that, you know. Um, so it's it's it, it's got to be spontaneous laughter where there's no consequence to your actions, you know. And it could be playing charades. I don't know. Whatever it is. Something that gets you having a laugh with your mates. I've worked in addiction circles for years and working in rehab centers with people who just write themselves off whenever they got a chance kind of thing. So, and, and that was their kind of play, if you like. And so we used to, on the weekends, as they progressed through their treatment, find different ways of saying to them, you know, you can actually have fun without getting sort of yeah. trashed, right? And and so we'd usually be fairly sceptical. What, we're going out in a boat fishing, you know, big lines? No, no, we're going out in a little boat. Brunswick River or something like that, and you got handrails, and we're going to see if we catch some fish, and we'll throw ourselves off the boat if we want, or we're going to go ten pin bowling, or we're going to go to an art gallery, and and usually there'll be eye rolls on God, and I never had a complaint with anybody when they came back from a day out. Of course, so that was actually fun. Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anyone's got any questions for Mark, put them into the chat room now because we're we're going to finish up the show very shortly. The last yep. chapter of Made Easily I'm looking out, and you mentioned something very. Very specific around boundaries. Mm. Yeah, um, can we can we go a little bit deeper here because that's the other aspect that we just seem to let things creep into our lives. And and firstly, I suppose the question is: is how do we set the right boundaries? Yeah, right. Okay. Um, look, boundaries. I think are and and being a psychotherapist, we talk about these with our clients all the time. And and so many people are afraid of setting a boundary; they don't want to upset somebody. And the first thing you need to understand about boundaries is that they don't actually rupture connection with anybody. What they do is solidify and cement it. Good friend of mine, um, Joe Hart, says, one careful no is worth 100 lazy yeses. So when you set a boundary uh, and, and you push back in somebody, uh, and you don't, it doesn't have to be no, bang, that's a barrier, yeah. right? That does sever connection. Um, uh, in 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 what do you call it? Uh, interpretive comedy, sort of. You know, you you sit in an audience and somebody suggests uh, a scene and suggests some players, and they'll start acting it out without a script, etc. Now we're back yeah. in the play space again. But in terms of boundaries, they will never say the word no. They say yes and yeah, right. To sort of continue the thing going, and we can do exactly the same thing with boundaries. So that a couple of points, a boundary, others call them non-negotiable. I'm not a fan. I think everything has a negotiation as long as it's on your terms. Yep. You know, I go, to, I go to my spin classes three nights a week. If Luke said, you know, we need to do this thing at nighttime, I won't say no. But I will say, OK, but then I'll negotiate and say I'm going to have to go to spin class in the morning because my exercise is important. Yeah. So we set boundaries around what's important to us that we need to sort of ensure that we're keeping ourselves safe. Generally, we need to tell other people about them and you'll find that they respect them because they now know that you have limits. And when you do say yes, they know you're reliable and dependable. And the only person who's going to have an issue with your setting a boundary is someone who kind of stood to gain by you not having it. So that person yeah. was going to use you. Fuck them. We don't need them, right? So we, we can set a sort of a safe boundary. The most important thing about boundaries is you set it around your values, not your emotion at the time. I'm tired, so I'm going to set a boundary. I'm not going to go out or something, you know, whatever it is. That's that's kind of not a boundary. That's a mood, right? Um, the, we set boundaries around values. What's important to us? I value my exercise, so I have a boundary around ensuring I get it. I value um people respecting me so you know if someone's continually 10 minutes late to, to my meetings stop having the meetings for a while and just see what their response is you know i will find some way to ensure that i'm getting sort of what i need or negotiate some kind of a compromise between the two and and we need those for our own sort of 
first of all, for our own self-esteem and self-worth and self-care, but also there's sort of a self-compassion. If you're feeling somebody's trotting all over your boundaries, then you need to do something to take care of yourself and, and know yeah. that it's okay that you're doing that. That's self-compassion. You know, yeah. life's hard and we're all doing the best we can uh, and I will do whatever I need to do to make sure I'm okay. That's about Mate, it. fantastic. Um, this is the book. It's called Up Yours, The Pursuit of Radical Self-Care. Mark, we've only just scratched the surface of the book. Mm. What else will, What else is in this book, mate, that people will get a benefit out of if they purchase it? And all the links are below in the copy as well, everyone. So please make sure you do check it out. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I think it's, um, as I say, self-care is more than sleep, diet, exercise. Uh, in, in the book, I talk about it being a radical sort of ex, um, a radical approach to, to look at, you know, getting the best from ourselves. So I think we talk about things like emotional intelligence and, and, and empathy. We talk about resilience and what that means. And it's more than just the company trying to squeeze more out of us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's very much a self-care practice. We talk about, uh, we talk about uh, other issues like how to work smarter, not harder. You know, as yeah. I said, boundaries is an important one. Um, so, so it's, it's around, pulling what we want from you know from the book that will sort of resonate for ourselves and i and i run training programs for entire organizations around it uh the self-care bento box is one program that we run with organizations it's a series of lunch and learns basically each chapter is a lunch and learn sort of session with an ask me anything uh and i do a lot of um i'm, I'm back doing what i used to do before covid and that, and that is perform uh, team performance coaching so in other words getting the best from teams who are high pressure environments and and are high performing teams delivering the best because they're the ones you know they're the racing team right and the racing team needs as much support as anyone else uh and and that comes from my experience of working with people right at the sort of extremes of of what's required from society yeah amazing mate well yeah if anyone wants to get in contact with mark you can reach out to us at kappa or go to mark directly uh, Mark Butler is your website, isn't it? Yep, .com. markbutler.com.au. Fantastic. There Check it all out, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for joining us once again here for a cup. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us in the chat room this morning. Uh, some great little comments popping up as well. It is so important to look after self-care. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Mark, I'll catch you later. Thank you very much, Luke. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us once again here for a cuppa. Uh, please make sure that you join us for a very exciting week next week. We've got our NADOC week special. Uh, we've got Paul Callaghan for all our me members. Um, Paul Callaghan is going to be interviewing Dwayne Bannon-Harrison. The theme of uh, NADOC week this week is for our elders. They're going to be sharing some incredible stories. I've even got goosebumps just talking about it. So please make sure that you do join us. That is on Monday. And then our next open book, I'm going to move my head over to the side here. Our next open book is with Freefall, uh, a guy by the name of Brad Guy. 15,000 feet. What does it say here? A broken parachute, 80 kilometers per hour. Uh, and he's, he talks about how the tragic accident uh, had a mirac miraculous new life. So what a great book. I'm going to move my head away again. What a great book that's going to be for everyone to join us next Tuesday. So please make sure that you register for that. That is it. Cookie signing out for your Tuesday morning. Enjoy your week, everyone. And thanks for being a part of Cup of this morning. See you later. Bye.